message this morning, which is based off of uh, things I felt God was drawing my attention towards this week. I'm going to explain uh, what I'm talking about, but this message does not have, as, as far as I can tell, a confident flow, part one, two, three kind of thing that builds, you know. I would call it disorganized. In fact, I do. But, in, but what I really see is kind of like little vignettes, all of which have a common thread but don't necessarily flow into each other. So I suspect some of you, maybe there's eight, I don't know exactly, I didn't count. Seven of them will matter to you and the other one won't. Or six of them will matter to you and the other one won't. And there's not one major, major, there is one major point that's holding it all together, but it's, uh, you follow what I mean? So if I start to bore you in one part, just wait, because it'll change pretty quickly. <laughs> and what we're doing is we're going through some, some subjects that we're going to, repeatedly come back to throughout this year. Pastor Jeff and I were discussing this. Um, he gave a message, the first message of this year, I believe, um, which I took kind of the outline from that and turned it into this. And we're going to re return to these subjects in further detail repeatedly over and over this week because we believe it is the prophetic word to us. And it's important that we get it. Um, it's not a message we haven't heard before, and it's not something that we don't know, but we need to know it deeper and further. And it's the kind of thing, when you deal with God, you can talk about the same thing over and over again from completely different ways and build up a deeper and f larger picture of what God's doing and who He is and all these sorts of things. God is infinite, so we're not going to run out of stuff to talk about. But you might recognize some re recurring themes and recurring phrases over the next couple weeks and months. And that's on purpose. And I'm borrowing, <laughs> we started posting our sermons online in, uh, a different way, and it required us to title them. And Jeff and I being as organized as we are, <laughs> here not very, um, <laughs> about some of that stuff, uh, he would preach a sermon, and it would be up to me to just title it. And I would think I did a pretty good job. And he'd be like, it's interesting the title you gave that message. <laughs> Like, what does interesting mean exactly? And, uh, but the notes he gave me from his first message of the year, I think, had a title on it. And I'm going to use that as the title for my message today. And it's this, Against All Hope, Hope. This is uh, from Romans 4. It's talking about uh, the hope that Abraham had, which is what Pastor Jeff preached on. We're just going to mention that now. And then we're going to borrow this phrase to use as a descriptor of the nature, those of us who follow Jesus, as a description of our nature, the way we're supposed to be. Because I want to talk about, this week we've been confronted with, on repeated occasion, um, death. It started this week, Kayla's father passed away, as Kevin mentioned. Um, it's the anniversary, uh, Karen's brother's death. Today is the third anniversary of Gary Larson passing away. He's a very important member of our church. Um, even yesterday, a Christian author named Rachel Held Evans died. And full disclosure, I don't, I don't have a lot of agreement with some of the things that she talked about. Um, and I'm not saying that as I dig at her. I think she was a really, really gifted, gifted, gifted writer. Um, but I also didn't share the struggles she had, so it was hard for me sometimes to connect with some of the things she was sharing. And I only bring that up because I think it matters that... There would be times I would read some things she wrote, and it would usually be something like, you know how everybody does this? And I would say, no, you know. But she did, and other people, like thousands, of, I mean, she's on the New York Times and stuff. Lots of people saw what she saw. I just didn't always. Um, and sometimes it would bother me. And then the moment I found out she was sick two weeks ago, none of that bothered me at all. And I found myself praying that she would be well, and you know, the Lord didn't answer in that way. And this morning, or yesterday morning, she passed away, and I saw how much grief it caused for so many people. I felt no frustration. Um, and again, I'm not digging at her. I don't think I'm right about everything, and she's wrong about everything. I'm just being honest that I disagreed, and sometimes it frustrated me. But in the face of death, it did not frustrate me. And I think that what God is saying to me through that is a lot of what you care about doesn't matter. And so I think that when we face death, um, death in this life, it can reprioritize 
things. Often we spend so much time worrying about things that just don't matter or seeing things wrongly or uh, you can fill, fill in the blank. It's, we do a lot of things. We waste a lot of time and we care about a lot of things that just don't matter in God's eyes. And only every once in a while do we get a window where you can see uh, what really matters. And it comes in lots of different ways. And one of those ways is when we see someone passing away. Even as silly as it sounds, I mean, the guy who played Chewbacca died. And they, that kind of came out recently. And I was getting some texts. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, but as silly as that sounds, even that was just, it was this recurring theme this week of, you know, we all die. Even Chewbacca dies. And I know for, uh, I know that the, Kayla's dad, Gary Larson, Rachel Held Evans, all these people are standing before the Lord, and they don't really care what we think at all. I hope the guy who played, I hope Chewbacca's in heaven too. I don't know, but I pray that he knew the Lord. Um, I pray that he knew the Lord, but, but uh, I know they're all with the Lord, and they don't, they don't, they don't care what we have to say about them. They, they, only know, they know what the Lord thinks about them in pure form now, and, and that's great. Uh, but when we are Christian people, we need to think about our faith in times of highs and lows. We sing that song, From the Mountain to the Valley, and you're going to experience both. And when you come up against grief and death and pain or even just a misunderstanding between you and friends, you know, it can challenge or put pressure on our faith. And sometimes that's the time it really proves itself. Henry Nouwen was reflecting on the passing away of a uh, person that he'd become good friends with, right? Actually, near the end of his life, he started to serve. Henry Nouwen is like a famous theologian, and he kind of had a crisis of faith or personal crisis of some kind, and he ended up serving for a period of time uh, as a caregiver in a community of people, severely disabled people, and they would have people come live with them in a house, and they would care for them. He had no training. He was a theologian, a bookworm, nerd kind of guy, and um, wrote really deep stuff. And then now he's the guy who's got to, um, like day one, all right, you're in charge of bathing this guy and clothing him and all this kind of stuff. And he can't speak and he can't tell you if you're, hurt, if you're hurting him and all this kind of stuff. And he kind of freaked out a little bit, like, wait, wait, wait a minute. I am not able to do this. And, but then over time, this, he's, he calls him a boy because he was like 25. But this young man who couldn't speak taught him more about the peace of God and the love of God and the acceptance that God has for all of us than anybody he'd encountered, I guess, to that date. And then when that boy died, um, he started to reflect things. He wrote about it in a book that's called Adam. I recommend that you read it. It's really impactful to me. But he says when you encounter death like this, he says you ask yourself questions. Why do I live? How do I live? For whom do I live? And am I ready to die now or later? These are all very important questions we should all be reflecting on. Who do I live? Why do I live at all? How do I live? For whom do I live? Am I ready to die now? Am I ready to die later? And uh, you can prayerfully think through some of those on your own time, but it'd be very helpful to prioritize in our life forgiveness of others and um, those sorts of things. And, as, and when also when we encounter death, as Kevin mentioned, that's why I covered my notes, as pa- one of the important things that we're going to have to continually return to in the near future till we really get it is the eternal perspective because we tend to lose it in our culture. Some ancient cultures lived mostly thinking in this way because mortality was so common. I mean, like, I've heard stat- statistics, childhood mortality being 50% and stuff until not very long ago. You, so everybody was very well acquainted with death at all ages and was prepared for it way more mentally than we tend to be. And as a result, especially in our culture where we tend to only encounter this with more, less frequently, and we're not in a war zone, and we're in a generally comfortable society, we start to bring promises that God has put in eternity and try to apply them to our lives now. It's like, well, this is the way God wants us to live now. And it's not that God isn't going to bless us. You have to hear me, and we'll get to all of that. But the point is, if you start to 
too often grab things and promises from God that are intended to be seen out in eternity and pull them to now, you will be continually frustrated and disappointed by your Christian life. And it's just because we're doing that wrong. It's not to say God doesn't bless us. He absolutely does. He does frequently. And we should count on that. But the point I need to make, this is the central point that we have to hear today, I think. If you are a Christian, if you follow Jesus, you will encounter pain, struggle, disappointment, and grief. If you are a Christian, you will encounter pain, struggle, disappointment, and grief. It is not sinful or faithless to do so. That's also an error we find ourselves falling into at times. We criticize people that are struggling. Or we consider them sinful or faithless. Or we, cons- or we take that on ourselves. It is not sinful or faithless to do so. Consult the Psalms, mostly written by David, to find more about that. In fact... The closer we follow Jesus, the more we may encounter this in this life. Our Lord Jesus, God in the flesh, perfect man, was crucified on a cross, okay? It was a horrible death in this life. Two weeks ago, we celebrate his resurrection and all that means for us to eternity, okay? But hope is not lost. And against all hope, we have hope. A big piece of this is understanding the value of eternity, which is ironic I said that, I guess, because you can't probably put a value on something that's eternal and forever. But you need to be thinking about that. (coughs) Because we're going to encounter pain, struggle, and disappointment in this life. Every single one of us, little caveat, I suppose, When we live a life of sin, that brings upon our life death in every form. And so, as an an example, one is addicted to drugs, and they find from that addiction a destruction to their body. You reap what you sow. You follow what I mean there? So there is an element of we can leave behind some of this by turning to the Lord. But the way this world that we find ourselves in in now reacts to the purest forms of following Jesus, the most Christ-likeness, is they usually tend to kill them, you know. And there's people suffering and dying in Jesus' name right now. Most of us will not have to, but we should be willing to. And not be always disappointed um, when we encounter these things. So let me just take a break. We're going to read Romans 5, 1 through 5. And it helps to put some of this in some context of the hope we have in Jesus in the light of eternity and how we straddle now being in this world and not of this world and looking towards eternity, towards the kingdom of God and helping to bring the kingdom of God here now as Jesus did that kind of thing. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. That's huge. Peace with God. God calls us friend. That's also in this one. Um, Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into the place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. So that's a good description of eternity. And there's plenty more. This is just a little thing I've got here. Verse 3, we can rejoice too when we run into problems. Did it say if? No, that was the answer to that question. (laughs) It didn't say if. It says when. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they will help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. 
And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. I'm going to read verses 3 to 5 one more time, okay? See this in your own life. Do you rejoice? Have you thought, have you thought this way, or has the enemy poisoned your mind when you've encountered a struggle and you've turned against God because he let it happen? Don't get down on yourself too much. We all do that, but we must not. We must resist that temptation. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they will help us to develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation, and this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So, God believes in you. When you say, Jesus I believe in you and I accept you, if we want to use that language, as my Savior, you know, I'm following you now. He says, got it. And he believes in you. And so then as you follow him, you, you're taking up your cross as he takes up his, and you follow him and you go, this is really hard. And he turns and goes, yeah, I know, but I'm with you. And you go, yeah, but I don't think I could do this. He goes, yes, you can. I'm doing it with you. And the Holy Spirit strengthens you. So often we turn around like, I can't do this. Jesus thinks you can. And he's giving you some of this laid out here. These trials are going to produce in you strength of character. It's going to help you with endurance. You can take way more than you probably think. And he will, he will give you strength of character. And the strength of character will help develop the confident hope of salvation. So that you can help other people because he believes in you. I was uh, looking on my computer a couple months ago for something because the aforementioned lack of organization. <laughs> I have like a folder for everything in this church that I ha and I sometimes don't subcategorize very well. So I was looking around for something, and I thought I found it, and turned out I found notes to some old sermon. I was like, what is this? And I started reading it, and I was like, man, that's pretty good. I have no memory of ever preaching any of that. <laughs> so, but I saw one thing that made me think about, uh, that I was thinking about when I was putting this together, since I just r ran into it. Sometimes people ask me, um, what's our church doing? Or something like that, you know? Um, and in, in my old sermon that I don't remember, I had encouraged everyone to think about that a little bit differently. Of course, there's times when we're here now, we're meeting, you know, we're praying, or we're singing, or we're ministering with the children, or, hey, guys, we're having a work day tomorrow, or, you know, whatever. There's things we do corporately, and that's very important, and I celebrate that, of course, and we want to continue to do that. But if we only understand a question like, what's our church doing, or what's our church doing about well, what's our church doing about homelessness in Jacksonville? What's our church doing about, you know, you can just, whatever. People ask me these kinds of questions, you know. And in my old message, it said something like, if you want to know what our church is doing, look at your calendar and the calendar of your friends, you know. It's like, what's our church doing about homelessness? And I go, watching Netflix four hours yesterday. That's kind of the answer, you know. And it's not bad to watch Netflix, but you get what I'm saying. We need to think about it. Whatever we're doing is what our church is doing. You see what I'm saying? And so... It's a reevaluation of seeing ourselves um, in a non passive category. Faith is not passive. Faith does not sit still, it takes steps. You must also take steps to walk in faith. And whatever steps you take are the steps our church is taking, either into deeper bitterness towards God because He's promoting you into ministry or into the helping of other people because he believes in you or into endurance, strength of character, and the confident hope of salvation. Another way I saw this, Jeff and I were in Thailand in like 2006 and we went and we visited a church there. There was actually a guy 
um, speaking, who was from Canada, and he shared, we came in late, and we were outside, actually, um, but they had the doors open so you could hear, and he made a passing comment um, that kind of stuck with me. Uh, I hope this means something to someone. It may just be one of those, like I said, <laughs> little vignettes, and you can just delete this one, but he made a reference to Apparently, earlier in the service, they'd prayed for a sick girl. It was like a little girl who was sick, um, small child or something. And he was, like, talking about seeing Jesus in the least of these and all that. And he said, uh, well, like that girl that we prayed for. And he was like, where is she? I'm just hearing this, you know. And he's like, oh, wait, she's Where? outside. And then he was like, she's outside playing with Jesus. And he's like, what are we doing in here? And I was sitting outside going, what? What is that guy doing? What is he talking about? Like, we're having church in here, you know? And, uh, but it kind of sent me down a little pathway, helpful reflection of, and I use this question a lot, you know, like, what are we doing in here? Not just here on Sunday, but, you know, in my life. Yeah, I'm like, what am I doing in here? <laughs> you know, kind of, it was, a, it was my own little version of uh, Henry Nouwen's far more eloquent why do I live? How do I live? For whom do I live? And am I ready to die? What are we doing in here? It's been a very helpful question. Delete that if that wasn't helpful to you. But <laughs> like I said, now, part four, no. Um, so how do we find, like, living this out, we need to further live into, we've had a core verse since the beginning of this church, since before I got here, and I got here at the beginning pretty much. Pastor Jeff was sent by God to here to found this church with this verse. You guys probably know it, 1 Thessalonians 2.8, and we take out of that that our goal here as a church is to share the gospel and share our lives with people. And over a my experience in the last 15 years being here, which is a long time, I find that we've got people amongst us that are really good at sharing the gospel. I think Gary Larson was one of those people. I think James White is one of those people. I think there's, there's, there's people very good at that amongst us. And there's people that are really good at sharing their lives with people. I mean, you've got very, very few who are good at both. And I think that God is calling us to be good at both. One of those will be probably more intimidating than the other, depending on who you are. And it will make you uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable at times, you know. Following Jesus is not about our comfort, as I have mentioned But that's how we're going to find uh, the way to actually live this stuff out. Pastor Jeff, in his notes that I'm stealing, talking about this, wrote community, which is kind of what this looks like, a discipleship community where we share about Jesus and share with each other in all the ways you can mean that. So we have to reach our community, the greater community, those around us that don't know the Lord yet. And to be a point of light, he says in his note. Another challenge to do this, to get real. People don't want to know the fake you. They want to know the real you. Third point is, the mess is okay. And it says, don't freak out. It is not possible to do this in some sort of pottery barn sort of cleaned up sort of way, okay? I don't have a problem with part of your barn, except for it's too expensive. But the, uh, the uh, I guess I have one problem with it. <laughs> my point being, it ain't going to look pretty all the time, okay? You go, well, you don't know my family. It's like, yeah, I mean, come on. Yeah, we do. I mean, we all have family. So... It's not going to be. It's not going to be pretty all the time. Discipleship. Go deep. Make Jesus the King of every community. Purposefulness, you know. And some of the simplest ways to do that is just what Karen is saying today. Just <coughs> stepping out and saying that 
you know, that person was prompted by the Holy Spirit of God, and they acted on it, and look what it did. That was not hard, okay? We can do this. And then the last point, he says, sow diversity and reap unity. Something that's destroying our culture, you all know it, I know it, it happens because of Facebook, it happens because of whatever, is that we've now found ourselves in what you might call like a silo of only people that think the same way you do about every single thing, and everybody else in the world is an idiot for some reason. And uh, I don't, we don't have to all agree. That's why it says reap unity when you sow diversity. It, you're, going to, you're going to disagree with people. Some people are nuts or whatever. Um, but God is calling us to reach out beyond that. And if you find yourself in that place, and it's not just theological, meaning churchy, it can be uh, political. Oftentimes, that's what we find. Um, it can be social cliques at school. It can be all sorts of different things. That's the easy road. Okay? We are called by God to resist that path. And that will cost you something. But it will also bring you closer to the kingdom of God. So, we're going to move to two last things. And uh, when, I, when we were reading this, Romans 5, 5, it talks about the hope of salvation. That our hope is in the sal- salvific power of Jesus in our lives in every way. It says it will not lead to disappointment in the end. Another place it says, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So it will not disappoint. For we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And so... I want to do two things in response to this, both of which involve the Holy Spirit, okay? If, when I read this, because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love, and you go, I don't know if I have that, I need you to come forward, even now or when I say in a little bit, because we need to pray for you, because you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's right. This is an important aspect of every Christian life. The power to live a Christian life comes from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we can get technical. It can happen when you get saved. It can happen when you're baptized in water. It can happen when someone lays their hands on you and prays for you. But you have to see that this is an important aspect. It's not just the place where miracles happen, though it is, but also the miracles of being able to live our lives and not be crazy. You see what I'm saying? This is, the, this is what he's saying. When you encounter these, these struggles, these temptations, all of this dark and evil stuff, for we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. If you do not have that, you need to come down here now, and we're going to pray for you. So like now, everybody stand up and start to come down here, and we will lay hands on you and pray. But, and as we do that, no, come. That's good to come now. And, okay, well, whatever. But I want to do one other thing. This will get you guys to actually come down here, and then you can stay afterwards, uh, and we will lay hands on anybody who wants to have their to be laid on. But I did not ask permission for this, so I hope he'll forgive me. But, Dwayne, will you come up here? Pastor Jeff had a friend, has a friend. His name is Dwayne. He was the director of Cornerstone is a missionary organization, Cornerstone International missionary organization that Pastor Jeff serves on their board, and he's now our friend. Here, come up here. And the Bible says, if you say, why is he in town? He's in town because he's under treatment for a cancer situation. And we believe that God is healing people miraculously and through medicine, and we also believe 
that his word says, if any of you is sick, gather around, anoint them with oil, and pray for their full healing. And I felt that God wanted us to do that today. And then, afterwards, I'm going to ask him, me and any, a couple other guys, I'll ask, uh, to lay hands on anyone who needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So first, Dwayne, if you'd come, come here, and we're going to gather around. So anybody that needs to come lay hands on Dwayne, I want you to come. And we're going to pray for him first. And then, uh, and then we're going to pray for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit if they need to be.